think it's just loading. And it's taking its time. Okay, amazing. All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending Mind the Bleeps webinar series. Our talk this evening is on the ins and outs of life as a medical registrar, with a particular look at diabetes and endocrinology, given by Dr. Anna Schultz. So there will also be an opportunity for Q&A at the end. So without further ado, Dr. Anna Schultz, everyone. Hi, nice to meet everybody. Um, as we go along, I'll share my screen so you can see the slides. But if you just type any questions you have in the chat, um, I probably won't be able to see it whilst the slides are up, but I'll be able to answer those questions at the end. So. Lovely. All right. So I've mostly followed on, um, focus on endocrinology and diabetes, um, but I've also put in a little bit about being a general medical reg and um, because they pair together very well. So I'm a registrar in Wales, in Cardiff, and I'm currently ST6, although I should already be a consultant, but I've taken my time um, and enjoyed it along the way. So the main part about the webinar, I'll say a little bit about myself and my experiences, but the main part is going to be part one, which is what is diabetes and endocrinology? What is general medicine? When you're thinking about it as a registrar, what's my usual week like and then how to prepare for your applications so i'm not sure at what level you guys are if most of you are medical students or um foundation or um imt but it's really good to just have a look if you're doing want to do medicine or surgery at some of the scoring um points for the applications they change every year but they're broadly the same and it will help you if you're given an opportunity to do a project or an SSC to kind of realise that you can tick a box if you just present that to the um, to a local meeting. Suddenly you've got points that you didn't realise that you would have. And then part three is going to hopefully be the majority where you can ask questions um, and I'll try and answer them. Because I know that it's a Thursday evening, so I'd keep you too long. So who am I? So this all started back at medical school, but I actually, I did foundation in 2011. And like I said, I could have, if I'd gone straight through and hadn't taken any time out or gone part-time along the way, I would already be a consultant for the last two or three years. But I'm still only 35, which to me isn't that old. So it just shows you that you can do a lot along the way. Um, in Wales, it's very encouraging and there's lots of opportunities. So um, they did an academic or medical training, which is what internal medicine training was, um, has, yes. And um, I managed to get a master's of research. And that was all a bit of a fluke and being in the right place at the right time. And I did that during my core medical training. And I really enjoyed all my jobs but I wasn't sure which medical specialty to go into. So I thought, what do I do? So I just took a year out and it gave me that time to build up experience as a general medical registrar. And I fell into endocrinology because I was meant to cover it for a few weeks and realised the thing I hated at medical school, I absolutely loved. And I got so much stuff done in that year that helped me for my specialty training application. And then... I kind of got talked into doing a bit of research, which um, thankfully is coming to an end now. It's been very good, but over the last few years, I've realised I just really love the clinical part. Um, but there's lots of opportunities, especially in endocrinology and diabetes. And because I never want to grow up, even though I'm only a year away from being a consultant now, I'm going to take another year and be a clinical fellow in cystic fibrosis because there's lots of overlap with um, metabolic medicine, endocrinology and diabetes there too. So this is what I've copied and pasted off a website. Um, the Royal College of Physicians have a medical care website and actually it's quite good for all the medical specialties. It's got lots of information. So the reason why I really enjoy diabetes and endocrinology is 
hormones and endocrine glands are everywhere and affect most things in the body. And it's, so it's got wide range of skills and you get a wide range of expertise. So you can never be bored. So you've got your little human, you've got the pituitary, you've got the thyroids and the parathyroids, the pancreas, the adrenals and the gonads and all the other um, myriad of hormones in between. It affects so many things, metabolism, reproduction, your stress, your well-being, and these all in turn affect each other. So this is why it's also a great specialty to do if you like general medicine. So you like variety, you like the acute on call, because as an endocrinologist, you have to be aware of every part of the body. And forget the feedback loops. I did not understand diabetes or endocrinology at medical school. These negative feedback loops, I didn't really get it. My brain turned off. But um, the way I think about it is your body is like a seesaw. If you imagine, say, thyroid stimulating hormone on one end and T4 on the other, both your body likes both to be in normal range, like a nice stable seesaw. And then if something goes wrong and you get low um, T4, then it's an equal reaction. Your TSH should go up from your pituitary to try and shout at the thyroid gland, come on, wake up, wake up. And if it's the other way where your TSH is too high, um, or it's too low, then yeah. So it's all opposite and reactive. And then I get excited when the seesaw breaks and either both things are high and they shouldn't be, or both things are low. So high TSH, you shouldn't have a, um, a high T4. That's not what your access is meant to do. So I'm not going to go into that too much because it's much easier to write it down as I go along. But I think if you're at medical school and you're struggling with endocrinology, think about the glands talking to each other. So if you're with a pituitary, you're trying to tell the thyroid or the adrenal glands what to do. If they're not listening to you, what would you do? Would you shout louder? Or if they're making too many hormones, then you would just shut up because you don't want them to make any more. And that is what I find interesting about specialty. It's quite imaginative. And some things on the screen may not be up in red or highlighted as out of range, but the pattern isn't right. And then you can be a bit of a detective. So just because something's normal on the readout doesn't mean in that clinical picture that it's the right thing. And there are other specialties where it's a lot more black and white and frankly, that's a bit boring. So as an endocrinology registrar, my typical week is a mixture of general medical ward rounds. And if we're doing our job right as endocrinologists, we shouldn't have that many endocrine patients as inpatients. And usually they are in the hospital, they're in neurosurgery or under surgery or in intensive care. And most of it we manage as outpatients. Diabetes, Yes, you get more of those as inpatients, but a large majority of our wards are usually general medicine. And I've done a lot. I did three gastroenterology jobs and a respiratory job, all of which were very busy. And there was always a disaster at about five to five. Um, you can still get very sick patients in on your general medical ward as a diabetes reg, but you're less likely to have lots of people bleeding all at once, like on gastroenterology. So it's sometimes on the whole more predictable. You get your um, a few clinics a week, maybe about um, three, and there'll be a mixture of diabetes and endocrinology. And that's a really nice change in pace because you're still on the general medical rotor as, um, as an endocrine reg. And you get all your kind of fast paced emergencies then. And it just means that you've got more energy in between. Because what I found when for um, the last two months of my um, core medical training, I acted up as a respiratory registrar, which I enjoyed. But you're always on the go and everything kicks off at the end of the day. And they need two drains at once. Whereas endocrinology, I miss some of the practical procedures that I enjoyed in core medical training. But to be honest, a few of my friends who've gone into respiratory within a few months, they are tired of 
doing drains because actually after you've done 10, they're all quite the same and they take a lot of time and a lot of faff. So it's about really talking to the people who are going, who are doing the specialty that you're thinking of that you want to do and talking to the consultants because most respiratory consultants will never do a drain again. So I've got that nice mixture of variety. I've got a nice group of people to work with. You will also work with the diabetes nurses and they're really useful because they do the education. They know lots of hints and tips. They can follow up patients as an outpatient. And increasingly with diabetes and with insulin pumps, the amount of amazing data and graphs and monitoring that you get um, is making it in a way more and more complex, but is meaning that you can tailor things more and more. And I really enjoy that part because endocrinology, you're being a detective. Why is this person tired? Are they just tired all the time? Or have they got Cushing's? Or have they got this? Or have they got that? Um, and then diabetes is a lot more, in a way, psychological. You've got all these amazing methods of controlling diabetes now and people are living, you know, normal life expectancies. But why do some people struggle or why are some people who were getting on great with their diabetes, it's suddenly all just tailed out and has gone up the creek. And it's about finding out and finding compromises. So I really like that balance. And you now are having increasing amount of opportunities for working less than full time, either with, you know, a day a week for research or for teaching depending on which deanery you're applying to. And there are lots of fellowships out there once you're a registrar where you can take a year and you know, I know somebody who's going to America, but there are some really great ones as well in Birmingham or in London, where once you know more where you might want to subspecialize, you can go there. And the training is, it has changed just recently. So when I started, you SD3, so after your core medical training until SD7, but now you've got IMT. So that SD3 year is your IMT3 year where you won't necessarily do the specialty you're going to become a consultant in, but you get more experience as a general medical registrar. And then you've only got year SD4, 5, 6 and 7. But so we'll have to see how they squeeze in all the training there. But I think it's doable if they somehow reduce the amount of general medical on calls you do, you'll have more time for your own specialty. So, um, and you'll do a fairly equal mix of diabetes and endocrinology, but you may find it also depends which rotations you're doing which year. So in Cardiff, the main hospital is the kind of key endocrinology, um, you know, tertiary hospital as you were, as as you will, where they have referrals about pituitary tumours and adrenal tumours from all around Wales. And so you work quite closely um, as the department with the surgical departments and the neurosurgical departments. So when I'm in the main hospital in Cardiff, at least once or twice a week, I'll go to the neurosurgical ward to see post-operation, post-operative pituitary patients who have got transient diabetes insipidus and we have to figure out how many of their pituitary hormones are left are there any left what do we do and start them off on on their journey and then we follow them up for life and then other times I'll get called to ITU give some advice and then I won't ever have to see that patient again so lots of variety whereas in the small hospital in Cardiff that's where the um, consultants who specialise in insulin pumps are. So there are a lot more diabetes clinics and um, and specialist meetings. And they've even, you know, I've sat in on an eating disorder clinic. There's weight management clinics. There's endocrinology covers everything. And diabetes um, is really varied as well. And actually in Cardiff, they've got a special um, cystic fibrosis diabetes clinics because cystic fibrosis patients also get diabetes. So if you're techie, you can really get into the tech of these. Um, if you've seen those free Libra um, monitors that people can just use their phone 
and scan over to see their blood sugars and it will show a continual reading or pumps. But if that's not what you're interested in, then you can you'll just see a mixture of type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes where people aren't on insulin pumps. Or if you want to do as a consultant both endocrinology and diabetes, you can combine those. Or if you want to become the world leading expert on Cushing's disease, then, you know, you can work towards that. So a huge variety of opportunities. And then general medical registrar. Everyone, I was put off applying as well for specialty training straight after call medical because everyone said, oh, my God, you want to be a medical reg? That's so hard. Why would you do that? You must be crazy. Well, I realised most of the people who were saying that were people who are more, who enjoy and went into anaesthetics or surgery or orthopaedic surgery. And not everyone in each specialty has the same personality, but you will find you gravitate towards certain specialties. And if you go into your general medical on calls, especially in the first couple of years, you're always going to be a bit, you know, a bit on edge. But if there's an edge of excitement there and you and when everything's well staffed and it's not completely going crazy like it is a little bit at the moment, if you're enjoying that variety of a chest pain or a breathless person or a headache and you enjoy that, then I'm sorry, you're probably a med reg in the making. And what one of my friends said when I was an F1, he was a CT2. So now an IMT too. So he was about to become a medical registrar. And I said, aren't you terrified? And he said, no, because unlike you, I've seen four years of medicine. So after medical school. And by the time he arrives somewhere, he's already seen somebody in heart failure before or seen someone with sepsis. And as a medical registrar, I get called where most of the stuff has been done by you guys, where... The fluid bolus has been given, the bloods have been taken, the chest x-ray is done. I have an ABG given to me. And so that's why it looks like medical registrars like are amazing because they turn up, they look at things and you've been there for an hour and a bit trying, struggling and not knowing what's happening. Suddenly this person arrives and just says, oh, we need to do this, this, this and that. And you think, wow, I couldn't do that. But really, if someone else had done all the work for you and you came in fresh and not kind of panicked, then you would be able with a bit of experience to do that, too. So I think don't see a medical registrar as a terrifying prospect. You're not going to do it for at least four and a bit years after you qualify because you need to build up your experience. And what I'm seeing a lot of is where people are taking out a year out after F2 to do F3. And that's fine. But don't stick around there too long, because if you start locuming and doing F4, F5. Then if unless you're really having to like apply for a very competitive specialty and really build your um, CV, then actually what you're doing is you're learning your trade to become a medical registrar. And doing all the rubbishy jobs that SHOs have to do, like phone this person or do that. And you're on the phone for a half an hour and then it turns out nobody cares about that result anyway. You suddenly then have to go back and do those three years again as an IMT. And I've seen people who actually think that they would have wanted to be medical registrars in the end decide not to and take the decision to go into GP because it's not so... they. Training is long enough and they've already done it, but they just haven't got the badge for it. But competencies are coming and the curriculum are changing. So it may be that if you can evidence what skills you've picked up along the way, you might be able to get some of those to count. So it's just seeing what things are when you get there. But I really enjoyed having my locum year in between my core medical training, my SHO year and my formally becoming a training registrar it gave me a lot of opportunities um and it meant that I could be really sure and you've got to think you're going to be doing this for decades so 
don't take forever, but also you don't need to be panicked about rushing either. So I think a medic talking about a medical registrar to really do it justice, we'd probably have to have a few of us here from different specialties because in the UK, um, almost all medical specialties now, you're trained in your specialty, but you'll be dual accredited in general medicine. And why do I love it? Well, I love diabetes and endocrinology because of the variety. And I also love general medicine because of the variety. Every age group, every in endocrinology, we're doing a lot more transgender things as well, but it's still very specialist. So, um, you know, it's not that common. It's not in the, your day to day because it's in very uh, specialist clinics. But every age, every gender, you get to problem solve and you get to follow people up for a long time. And you also get to swoop in, give your opinion. Everyone's very grateful and swoop out again. So the variety of my day, of my clinics, of my weeks, of my month, I really value because I acted up as a respiratory reg for two months at the end of CMT. And I enjoyed it, but I felt within those two months I'd become quite comfortable in the clinic. Whereas when I start and then you have another however many decades of that obviously you're building up your specialist knowledge and I was just doing very simple things but in endocrinology when I sat in with one of the top professors even he had to look things up at times and if you're having to do that 30 years down the line that's that's exciting because not everything that you're taught is rare is actually rare so There are seven different hormones in the pituitary and they could all go wrong in different ways. So as so individually, each of those things going wrong is rare. But when you're in an endocrine clinic, you'll have lots of pituitary patients with different combinations. And um, and that's really nice to follow them through. And it's rare to necessarily diagnose somebody for the first time with a pituitary tumour. But a couple of months ago, I had... two two in a week um, that I came across in the hospital. So, and I like going round different parts of the hospital, different teams, not just within the very varied um, multidisciplinary team in diabetes, which is nurses, podiatrists, dietitians, and they're all really specialist. Um, But also in endocrinology, we have pituitary MDTs with the neurosurgeons once a month. We have we have endocrine surgery MDTs with the um, endocrine surgeons. So um, it's really, really varied, like really varied. And also quite a few of the biochemists we work quite closely with. And you, some endocrinologists even get involved in bone clinics or weight management services. And we had to cover all of those. So you've got that mixture, you've got that varied pace, and you've got a mixture of science, psychology, sociology, and a huge range of potential subspecialties, or you could just stay very general if you want to. So you can, I'm still trying to choose exactly what my future will be as a consultant, but the world is your oyster, and you're not just going to get stuck with a small group of um of options. So part two, um, applying. And sorry if anyone's writing in the chat, I can't see it, but I'll answer questions if they're there later. So whatever stage you're at, I would look at the um, application scoring. You can just Google it or you can look at this website and they change every year. So even from medical school, I was a little bit clueless. I knew that audits existed, but I didn't really understand what they were. I knew that it was good to get a poster, but I didn't really understand how to do it. And actually, I just wasn't asking the right people or in the right way. Um, And if you can get things ticked off at medical school, they will count for your um, specialty applications and make your life easier. Um, But if you haven't done anything, then it's fine. You've still got time. Um, but keep a rough CV, even if it's just a list of presentations of 
um, not necessarily publications because they're harder to come by, but anything you do, write it down. And because it's amazing, after a couple of years of working, you'll completely forget that you delivered a teaching session or that you presented this thing for your boss. And you think, well, that wasn't that much. But actually, when you come to the application form, suddenly that gives you two extra points over somebody else. Um, and when you look at the application form, which I'm going to go through, some bits are easier to score in than others. Some, if you've done an integrated degree, great, you've got those points. If you haven't, you haven't got those points. It's too late. You know, it may be that you haven't got time to sort that. And that's OK. But what you don't want to be doing is just doing teaching, teaching, teaching. And then it turns out that you're not scoring quite right and you haven't got anything in posters or presentations or quality improvement. It's better to get a few points in everything than just some points in one. And the scoring systems can change every year. So you need to kind of spread your bets a little bit. Um, and it doesn't really matter as long as the scoring systems are there for you to get an interview. And then even if thing, something doesn't technically score, if it shows how committed you are on other parts of your personality, then, then that will score you points in the end. So this um, is has changed since when I applied. You suddenly got these points for commitment. And if you look at the bottom, it's not quite... Um, part you know it it helps you get the offer but it doesn't um or get the interview but it doesn't necessarily help you once you get to the interview because in the interview you need to prove this again it means that just because you've worked an endocrinology job and had a presentation well you could have done that if you're on another specialty and also they don't want, not everyone can do a job in the specialty they want to as an F1 or F2 or IMT1. Um, so they're trying to make it fairer. So if you can take advantage of taster days or that you find out there's local meetings or regional meetings. So in Wales, twice a year, we have the Welsh Endocrine and Diabetes Society where you get good food and good talks. And it's just an afternoon twice a year. And some, you know, and they get a lot of medical students or F1s to either do a poster or present, then that's going to be ticking boxes. And for everything with e-portfolios or applications, there are boxes you need to tick. But if you can take the approach that you're trying to, you're trying to enjoy what you're doing and find interesting with just an eye to make sure that you've done 90% of the work, just make sure that extra 10% is done so that it can count on that tick box. But if you're just slavishly going for the tick boxes and have, don't enjoy what you're doing, then stop. Um, it should be interesting, otherwise it's not the right thing. So um, you can look this up on, that, um, on the website that I showed on the previous slide, but you can kind of see here, I don't understand why you get 10 points, six points and two points, but just make sure that you, if you do a taster day, even if it's not an official taster day or you do something, type it down on that rough CV because in two, three years, you'll have forgotten about it. And then undergraduate degrees, either you have them or you don't. Um, and I, they may be taking some of this these scores away because, again, with the cost of living and the price of university fees, this isn't achievable for everybody. So in the next year, it may be that this isn't going to score, but I'm not sure. They keep prevaricating about it. And then postgraduate scores, you know, these are relevant. And but again, not everyone can get it. I feel that often postgraduate diplomas and certificates just add a whole lot of work in your spare time and take a lot of money a lot of the time off you. So yes, they score things, but you can see that they don't, um, 
they're not scoring a huge amount, two points. So don't rush into something. If you want to do it and you know you're really interested in it, then do it. But don't just do it because because you'll be burning yourself out, wasting money or wasting time. And two years down the line, you realise, oh, I should have spent that time and that money on this thing that I really love. There are other ways on these other points of additional of, you know, presentations, publications, quality improvement that you can be scoring even more points. So don't panic about this. They're nice cherry on top. So additional achievements. Again, either you had them at medical school or not. Um, but um, you can also there are lots of if you look at the Royal Society of Medicine, Royal College of Physicians, the Endocrine Society, Diabetes UK. There are so many essay competitions that I didn't even know existed um, before it was too late, really. And if you find an area that you find interesting or is overlapping with a an essay you're already doing, then if you don't apply, you you don't have the opportunity to win these prizes. So, um, you know, so I think, and what's unfortunate, you know, so they work out as a national prize, which sounds a little bit intimidating, but some of these prizes and essay prizes, people don't know about. So actually not that many people apply and, so you are actually in a much better chance than you realise. So presentations. These are case reports or quality of improvement projects, lots of different things. And you can go back and look at this in more detail. Um, but my pet theory is for there are millions of conferences, millions of medical conferences, and they're all quite expensive. They always do a much cheaper rate or free for medical students. But the way that they get people to turn up to them is they hold out this carrot of you could have a poster and or a presentation. And actually, you know, if you find a consultant or a registrar who also all need to be showing that they're involved in quality improvement or audits, is there a very simple data collection thing that I can do and be involved in? And if there is, would it be able to be a poster at the geriatrics meeting or the endocrinology meeting? And suddenly you'll get it done. A poster, I remember doing it as an F1 because I was bullied into it by a registrar. And I thought, what is this black magic? But there are lots of templates online and essentially it's 900 words on a page or really big pictures and people will be very willing to help you. And suddenly you've got almost as many marks as if you'd done an integrated degree. And I did an integrated degree and got no presentations and no publications. So, you know, really a poster is a really easy thing to get if you have somebody to help you show you the first time. And what I find with um, projects and things is that once somebody is shown you, you can help somebody else, either your friend or someone in the year below you. And suddenly they get their name on a poster. And because you've helped, you get it on the poster. And suddenly it kind of, you know, snowballs. But if you've had a first author presentation or poster at a national meeting, you don't need five of them unless, you know, you're really into a project because you're not going to get any more marks. So you think publications. And Mind the Bleep offers opportunities to score some of these, so non-peer-reviewed articles. Um, the BMJ have lots of opportunities as well. So um, even after you've finished medical school for the first two years, F1, F2, you can still write in the student BMJ and that will still count. So, um, and I'm sure you all know what PubMed is. So you have to kind of check if it's PubMed or not. And co-author means that you're one of the authors. So if you've helped collect some data that has taken hours and hours, and then you hand it over to somebody and they do all the magic, you should still be an author. 
So just make sure if you're collecting a load of data, oh, is this going to be published anywhere? Or can you let me know when it is? Here's my email. Don't forget me. Um, because one, um, you know, because a lot of people at every stage are looking to publish and present and there'll be multiple authors. So, you know, you can get points on this as well. The teaching has really changed and it used to be, um, you know, that you've got a lot more marks for providing regular teaching, but it is a bit better because it used to be that you'd have to, um, you know, have, it would only count if you'd organised it and run it for six months and designed it and all these things. So, you know, I think this is pretty good. Um, and, you know, you and go from there. So the quality and also teaching your colleagues and your peers, you'll all have to, I'm sorry, but keep revising for exams um, throughout your training. So teaching people is a great way to revise. And for endocrinology and diabetes, once you have joined the specialty, there is an exam, which um, is, you know, two multiple choice, um, you know, question papers that you do part way through your training. But it's, it's mostly about guidelines, but it's really interesting because you've chosen endocrinology and diabetes, hopefully, because you find it interesting. And I learned a lot more than I thought I would. And, you know, the pass mark isn't too bad. So, but, and you can claim the money back against tax that you spent on it, but you will be doing lifelong learning. So if you can incorporate teaching other people into it, then you score marks for your application as well. And then the quality improvement, there are, um, this I think is very difficult when you're starting out to know what is quality improvement. And a lot of the time you'll get involved in something that's either not achievable because the consultant who's given it to you is over ambitious or it's, or you think, oh, you have picked something that's really boring. But the way that I've done it is get involved with people who know what they're doing, make sure it's small defined and you know what you're going to get out of it. And then as you build up time and experience working, I now look at quality improvement projects as what is annoying me most? Fine. Can I measure it? Can I change it? Do the change I would have done anyway? and then measure it again, and then, you know, oh, I thought this would help, but it hasn't helped as much because we need to do this other thing, and then you change that other thing, and then bang, you've got your two cycles, and you present it at the um, deanery meeting or somewhere, and suddenly you've got loads of points. So all these things you don't need when you leave medical school, you don't even need as an F1 or F2, this is what you'll be doing over your IMT and um, and just find a friend registrar or IMT person who has kind of done it a bit before and has a good idea and then just learn from them and go from there. Ooh, and then I forgot, I haven't got the leadership bit, sorry. Um, I'll show you guys that at the end. But leadership is now becoming more involved and it also includes um, things like, you know, if you've been involved on committees or charities, not just medicine and is increasingly an important part because when you become a consultant, you become a manager and that's really important. So to start building your CV, just try it, just write down what you've already done and things you did to get into medical school, you already had to think for your personal statement and things. Some of those things will be relevant to your future applications. You, you know, I've stuck at something. I was a team leader. I did this, I did that. Don't discount it just because you were 16 when you did it. And just keep asking. I realised that when I tried to ask, can I help with an audit or something like that, 
people go, oh, no, no, it's boring. Don't worry. Boring is great. Put on your music, spend an evening going through some notes and suddenly you've got points and points and experience. And then when you find something more interesting that you're interested in, you know how to do it. Um, but start small with easy wins because I've started a few projects with people and then realised it was never going to be measurable, never going to be achievable in the short amount of time that I was on that specialty or in that rotation. And don't discount yourself. Don't just be like, oh, it wasn't that much. Well, if it meets the criteria, it earns a point. And then commitment. It's about clinics and taster days and asking, oh, are there kind of, you know, what meetings are there? So endocrinology also overlaps with neuroendocrine tumours and that overlaps with gastroenterology. So there are specialist MDTs around the country for that. And that's very interesting. And just find out, you'll be surprised what's in your hospital. And then find a friendly and keen registrar consultant and just say, I want to be a data monkey. I want the most boring data that I can collect in like two or three hours that is going to get presented somewhere. And then if you've done that for them, then that person will go, oh, yeah, they were keen. Oh, do you want to do the poster and go on from there? And some of these, if you're at medical school, you can combine in your um, special study modules. Or if you're already working, you try and find time that you can do it in work hours. But sometimes you just need to, if you can team up with a friend to do a project. I Recently, I stayed back with an SHO and an F2 and we just got some um, just got some coffee and stuff and just sat for two hours in the mess after work and bashed it through and got it done. Um, there are lots of local meetings, loads of national conferences and international conferences that you don't know about. But if you Google it or ask, 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 then people will tell, tell you about. And the British Endocrine Society Conference happens every November. Loads of opportunity for posters. They give discounts and even bursaries to medical students. And Diabetes UK is a great charity and they also really want medical students involved. So um, and often even as foundation doctors, you're getting big discounts and IMTs on um, membership and you'll get a lot of career advice from there. So let me come out of there so that I can stop sharing and see if there's anything in the chat. Um, has anyone got any questions for me? Because there's a lot of me talking at you, but um, yeah, it's a bit of a whirlwind, but whatever you want to ask, I'm very happy to answer. Thank you so much for your talk, um, Dr. Anna. So I don't think there are any questions in the chat at the minute, but um, okay. yeah, feel free to pop any questions into the chat, guys. But what I will do is I'll kick you off. We'll kick it off with a, um, a question myself. So why did you pick this specialty and what is it exactly that you enjoy the most about diabetes and endocrinology? So I didn't... I went to medical school wanting to do plastic surgery and hand surgery. And then I realised partway through that what I enjoyed about it was problem solving and the variety and all the different types of patients you worked with. And I found that I was kind of drifting more towards medicine. But I didn't, I just, endocrinology, I thought, well, most of it's really rare. Am I going to see some of that chromegaly, diabetes? It's just like sugar goes up, sugar goes down. And then even during my core medical training, I didn't, I would see a high calcium or a low sodium and I'd be like, oh, I don't know. And then I took that, I was going to have that year off to make up my mind, whether it's GP or med regging after core medical training. And I helped fill in an endocrine job in a big hospital and they were just really friendly and they said, well, come to clinic you can just sit in on clinic because it's quiet on the ward. Or do you want to come and see some referrals, you know, with the SC7 reg? And suddenly I saw what endocrinology and diabetes was. It wasn't this dry stuff in um, textbooks that I couldn't really understand. It was very much you had to think on your feet, be inventive. Patients are weird. If you actually ask people, how much do you drink? They're like, oh, normal amount. How much is that? Ah, oh, it's three giant mugs of tea 
every hour, which means seven litres a day, that's why your sodium is low. Or you never eat salt, but you drink seven litres a day. So people are weird and wonderful. And I just love the variety. You can never become complacent. And I'm, I'm interested in people, but you've also got enough time to kind of be a be be a bit geeky. So it's not all or nothing. You have a big variety, and I like the ward, but I wouldn't want to do ward rounds all the time because it would send me mad. It's just about thinking whatever rotation you do in medical school or F one. What did you enjoy and what didn't you enjoy? And don't just think about it. Oh, I like that clinic. Think, well, why? Oh, I like variety. I liked this. I like that. I didn't mind that, but I hated those ward rounds. I never want to go on a ward round again. Then general medicine probably isn't for you. But what they've done is they've made it so that most general medical consultants aren't have breaks off the ward for a month or two, whereas they used to just continually be on the ward and then they all went mad. So, um yeah, because a lot of specialties will actually overlap with similar qualities of what you enjoy. And one of my friends did buy, fell into biochemistry a similar way that I did. She was just filling a year. She did not she want, know what she wanted to do. And she does lipid clinics, weight management clinics, genetic clinics, metabolic medicine clinics, and works in the lab. And she's the person you call when you go, oh, my God, the sodium is 170 or these lipids are this high. And so we work with them quite closely. See, see, thank you. Um, we've also got a question in from Tash, who I can really relate to this as well. Um, so she's a student and the idea of doing a quality improvement project is such a mystery. So what skills do you need before and how much support can you get? So it, you know, it just kind of, it makes most doctors go, oh because it just sounds like such a tick box thing. And a lot of people go, oh, I've done this. I was involved in one about antibiotic stickers. Didn't do anything. What was the point? What you, what I would say to think about is to think about, so they used to call it an audit, where you had and an audit is, there's a gold standard guideline, and then you mark is what is happening to that patient matching that. But actually, a lot of change that really needed to happen wasn't about some gold standard guideline. It was about how the ward runs, which isn't on a guideline necessarily. So if you think about it as a process or system that isn't working as well as it should, and you think you, and I would really stress this, talk to the nurses and other people, because you may not have thought something or they may have already tried it. So think about it. This thing annoys me or this thing isn't working right. I think this could change it. And then think, well, how could I measure it? And then how could I change it and then remeasure it? And then ask people how, what they think. Do they agree that it's been a good change? They'll make some suggestions. And then if you're on an, a foundation job, you're rotating every four months your mate's coming on the next job and you say to them, can you re-audit it? And suddenly you've got two cycles. Lovely. And the main way that I found my feet is some people, they get experience during medical school because of their special study module and or luck. Some people, it's much later, like with me. I had a registrar who did loads of audits and projects and he needed minions to do them you don't need to be clever you need to just have a very clear spreadsheet and 10 minutes of someone talking you through you need to you need to look up 20 patients here are the 20 patients what was their hba1c a year ago what is it now what medications are they on something like that and you go yes no yes no yes no enter it and then that that more senior person can analyse it and do everything. And then that experience will build up. And over time, you'll get more confident with how to use Excel or have watched more presentations. And one of the best quality improvements, you know, I've been involved in one where I designed a spreadsheet that counted as it went along. 
and it was and we covered 500 patients so the secret was there were six of us and we split it up and when you're working with somebody else it's much easier otherwise you would just give up and that became a really big presentation and two posters at national conference and all these kind of things but it wasn't rocket science it was just patients and lots of doctors are really busy or even podiatrists or dietitians because a lot of them are actually really senior and if you ask is there something you need somebody to go through notes for or online systems and just collect really boring data i have 2 hours that i am willing or how many hours that I'm willing to give you. And because there are also, especially in diabetes, lots of national audits and also in all specialties, asthma audits, smoking audits. And most people have to, who work in those specialties find them deadly boring, but they're not, you don't have to be very clever to do them. So just really stress, it can be the most boring, most mind-numbing thing but if it's going to actually come to something, I'm your person. And that's that's the way to do it, because you can do online like there's the bronze qualification for like QIP, quality improvement projects, which helps. But these cycles and PDSA, I find I go, I just like turn off. And that was what happened at med school with endocrinology. If I see feedback loops and algorithms, I'm like, oh, I don't understand it. When actually, when you do it, I'm much better. I see, I see. Thank you. To me, it really sounds like one of the most key things is to find someone who's a lot more senior that is really just happy to have you tag along and learn from them. And it doesn't always need to be senior. So when I was on, so my first job as F1 was ENT, and it was that Reg who got me in my the other F1 and I involved in lots of projects, and I would was lead on one she was lead on another so we both got first author on a poster but then we'd be the other one second author and so it meant that we stayed behind for a couple of evenings um in the office to go through this work and in but we were together and we had pizza and it was fun and we got two audits in one evening so and actually, one of the medical students that then joined on the special study module, he was way, he'd done loads of posters. So he actually showed us how to make the poster. So it's not always someone who's up above you. It's just asking around, like, oh, you did one. Like, what is it? Because then once you do it, you're like, oh, everybody was, I hated making posters at primary school. Remember, you know, or English, like, make a poster to, like, you know, wanted Romeo and Juliet or something. It's literally a bit like that. You just, nobody really reads them. It's just making it look nice. And then the conference people get more bums on seats. And if you think about it like that, it's much less scary. Because stuff I did at medical school, I so could have done it that way, but hadn't realised. And actually, at medical school, we had to do an essay in final year about you know a case about something and so I actually asked one of the plastic surgeons that I'd done a special study module with is there anything that I could do this on that you need to get published so it was two case reports and because I'd already done 90% of it as a 3,000 word essay then you know the red I gave it to the plastics registrar who wrote it like a proper thing and so he was first author, which in retrospect, I'm like, we probably should have been joint first author. But, you know, I was still second author and I'd still seen the process. So, you know, if you're doing something and a lot of stuff in medical school now is much more switched on. You've probably already had to present posters or case reports. You've done the work. Find someone to help you put it in the student BMJ or something or on Mind the Bleep website. Thank you. And Tash says thanks as well, and that makes it seem a lot less scary. Um, I don't think we had any, we've had any new other questions, but personally, I also wanted to ask, when did you personally start working on your portfolio, and do you have any advice on actually getting it launched? Um, I think... I'm trying to think. So, for... Um, for core medical training, which is now internal medical training, 
you need to, when you're filling out this application form, you start having to think, oh, what have I done? And it's not that much you're having to remember, it's two years worth. But then you also have to start thinking about, oh, I also did that in medical school. Oh, when I did that. Oh, yeah. And actually, if I'd written, kept a, just a list as I went along, which is what I do now, it would have been much easier. But um, it's still not that long to remember. But once you get into, and also the e-portfolio is quite a nice way to, because upload, it works as Turas for you guys, for foundation. Um, in the library, you can upload things. And because I didn't have Turas, I had ePortfolio, that's following me all the way through. So I've got all my ARCPs, which is your annual reviews on there. And which is kind of starts more from IMT. So they will be out there. But I remember my application for core medical training it was stressful because it took so long to try and think, what have I done? Find evidence for it. But then when I applied for my specialty training, I had a printed out copy of my core medical training. And a lot of it was copy and paste because I didn't really think that stuff that I did as an F1 would still count now. And it does. So, and if you've been a bit late starting, it doesn't matter. You've got time. And it's not that you've had 10 publications, one is enough. And a lot of people won't have had any publications, even if. So I've heard stories where somebody's really excited, somebody was really excited that they'd gotten, um, you know, a poster presentation at this London meet, at this national meeting in London. And somebody they were talking to, their peer in F1 was like, oh, how much, so how many, you know, other presentations have you done? And they're like, oh, it's my first. Like, oh, you've only done one. Oh. And later on, they found that person had done none. So, you know, whereas other places, most places that I've worked, everyone's very excited if you're doing something. Um, and it's just finding the right, the right people and um, bribing them with coffee or just turning up and just being a bit annoying because even consultants now have an e-portfolio and they need to show that they're keeping up to date and especially registrars and things they will need to do they'll need to do audits and quality improvement projects and they need minions and you just need to say take advantage of me as long as you get this in some workable format so I've got evidence like just use me but don't fall for something that's going to take months or is a how we fix the a and e or how we fix the ambulance service don't run away because you can't do that in two months thank you so much um we haven't had any new questions so i feel like everyone's oh at least your talk was really really informative so everyone's got no questions left um but thank you again so much for your time dr anna that's all right and um Yes, all the best. And actually, one of my one of the IMTs I work with is quite keen. So I've off, I've said to her if she and um, one of the F2s who's interested want to, if they want me to help them write an article on Mind the Bleep about it, then I'm going to help them do that. And it's things like that, that if you see an opportunity, go ask somebody. People love to help if they're asked, but everyone's a bit busy and they may not have thought about it, but you can say, I want to do this. If I do most of the work, would you help me? And most people will be a, like, will be pleasantly surprised and say yes. Mm -hmm. Thank cool. you. Cheers. All the best. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye.